Testing one, two, three. All right, hello friends. My name's Dan. Thank you for joining me again today. For Daily Art Adventure number 550. When I started this two years and 26, 26 months ago, two years and two months ago, um, I had in mind, by the time I do a thousand of these, I want to be really good at it. Still working on it. In fact, last night I was broadcasting and my sound wasn't working. Today discovered that my microphone was broken. Glad to hear that's all it was, not the, not the transmitter. Anyway, so this is, as I said, Daily Art Adventure number 550. Day number three, approximately, on the... Uh, oil stage of this large painting. I, I'll try not to bore you with the details, but um, with, with high degree of repetition, I feel like I'm in a new season in my life. And that's been the, the theory now for about six weeks. And uh, I might I might be completely wrong. You know, you don't really know when you're in a new season. Often until in in the rear view in your rearview mirror, in hindsight, you find out something changed. But this is one of those rare moments where I think I'm aware of the fact that I'm entering a new season. Of course, that might mean that means I might be wrong about that. <laughs> I'm, I may not be entering a new season at all. So, the new season is larger paintings. That's Larger paintings and better paintings. And by better, I mean taking more time. Taking time to get them right. Um, when I, the last time I worked on this painting, one of, the, one of the last things I did was lighten. That is to say, I made the, the bottom of the painting considerably lighter. So I was painting with a lot of Opaque paint applied very thinly, called also called scumbling, right? Somewhat onomatopoetic word, I believe, because it sounds like scumble, scumble, scumble. Anyway, so that's what I did last time. And I, I was saying as I was doing the scumbling that, um, whoops, I just ran into the garage door opener up there. Um, that the scumbling technique is very good for achieving color or value that you want very quickly. As you're covering large areas very quickly. So it's good for getting the color you want and the value you want. But, big, big, big caution here. But, people, it leaves, it leaves a texture that generally people don't enjoy. It's not a, it's not generally a pleasant texture. So you should know that if you're a, if you're a painter, use scumbling, use uh, thin layers of opaque paint applied very thinly, which then makes it translucent. Go ahead and do that, but just understand that's not a good uh, finishing point for your painting. So you need to do a, a couple different things after you scumble, and that's what I'm doing right now. The first thing is, it, it, that's all dry, of course, the, the, the scumbling from several days ago, last week, is dry. And uh, what I'm doing now to rectify the unpleasant texture is to come back and um, do a glaze on top of it. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna do a glaze over much of the painting. My favorite medium, Till I find one I like better is Liquin Original. It's a gel. You can pour it out on your palette and it more or less stays put. It, you don't need a cup or anything for it. That's one thing I like. It's a little bit smelly. That's the that's one downside of Liquin. Now out here <laughs> in my open garage, the smelliness is not an issue at all today, but it is sometimes. So, you might ask, has anybody asked it yet? 
Hello, Kalanami, 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 and IL Studio. Good to have you guys or girls, <laughs> as the case may be, joining me. Okay, ask me, why do you glaze? Well, down here I glazed because it was scumbling. Opaque paint looks better with transparent on it. In fact, that's why I'm glazing everywhere. Why? I usually say it this way, just because I'm weird. Um, why do I glaze? Because, ready? Ain't a color made that don't look better with something else on top of it. That's why. Because um, I can raise my painting. I can raise and lower it that much <laughs> out here in the garage. That's it. Um, ain't a color made that don't look better with something else on top of it, with, which is another way, simply, of saying uh, transparent colors are more interesting than opaque colors. Some of you caught some of my, perhaps my, I taught an art class for three days at the beginning of this week. I had a great time down in beautiful little Southport, North Carolina, charming little seacoast town with a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm drawing a blank with a very uh, strong arts community. So I judged a show for them on Sunday and then taught a class there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, had a great time. And there was a reason I was telling you that, and I forgot what it was. Oh, I know, I was talking about uh, transparent color. And I, I make that this statement often, you know, that ain't a color made that don't look better with something else on top of it, or simply saying transparent colors are richer and more interesting than opaque ones. And I don't know that anybody's ever said this to me, but I, I sort of imagine some some intermediate novice painter saying, well, I don't think so. I think opaque colors are just as interesting as transparent ones. And then I, I go to great lengths to describe, here it is, I'll do it quickly. An opaque color is a one bounce color. Here's the color, here's, there's a light, here's a color, bounce, and you're done. From the light to the paint to your retina, and we're done. Uh, a transparent color, I'm going to leave you in mystery for this. It's a, it's a B, um, B, R, B, R, R. Um, I, I'm a, anyways, it's a five, five, five steps that the light goes through from the time it hits the surface of the transparent layer, goes through it, through the transparent layer, hits the background, comes back again and exits. One, two, one, two, bounce, three, four, five. Five steps, five different things that a transparent uh, color does, whereas a, an opaque color is does one thing, bounce, and it's done. So it's not a matter of opinion. It's not like, well, I like transparent better and you like opaque better. It's not open for debate. It's a matter of physics. Now, the question might then well be asked, well then, why do any, why do any uh, opaque at all if transparent is always better? Ha, good question. The answer is because the aesthetic buzz, the aesthetic pleasure created by variety trumps the aesthetic pleasure derived by the richness of transparency. In other words, a painting with mostly transparent but some opaque colors is more interesting, more aesthetic pleasure derived from that than a painting that is all um, transparent paint. Whew. Hope that was clear. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go now back down to the bottom of this painting. Um, that looks really nice up there, glazed, by the way. I have work to do. This, this part of the painting, I'm thinking, is possibly completely finished. This is largely finished and less so way up there. But I want to tackle the bottom of this painting right now. Um, the first thing I did after, after the scumbling, which got it light, I, it had to be lifted up in value. It was too dark. 
So last week, the last thing I did is brought it brighter. Uh, after that, just a few minutes ago, I finished, as you saw, I did glaze on top of it, which makes it all more rich and interesting to look at because it, now it's transparent instead of opaque. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, well, actually, the next thing I'm going to do is mess it up a little bit with some with some random art marks. The, the tools I have in my hand here are a new toy for me. They're made by Shiva. They are artist's paint stick by Shiva. And a new toy, like them a lot. That was orange and burnt sienna. I'm, now I'm gonna do a little bit of yellow. Whoops. Flew out of the handle there. <laughs> and red, whoa. That red's powerful. <laughs> All right, now you, you may know that uh, those, those random strokes like that, I don't know which of those are going to remain visible in the final painting. I'm certainly assuming, rightly so, that many of them will be wiped out, covered up, diminished, and so forth as the painting goes along. They will be, but not all of them. And it's, I don't know which ones. It's not my job to know which ones. It's just my job to make sure that um, all the marks that I make are attractive or pleasant. And that's achieved by simply by making them boldly, confidently, joyfully, if you will. You don't have to be in a good mood to paint, but your hands and arms need to move in such a way as if you were in a good mood. Fair enough? You don't have to wait. I've done some of my best paintings when I didn't feel like painting. I was not in the mood to paint. So you don't have to wait till you're in the mood to paint. But by the time you start painting, your arms and hands have to move in a manner as if you were in a good mood. And I'm sure even that, that's not an absolute rule. I'm sure there are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, I believe that is the case. All right, I don't know if you guys can see my palette or not. Not quite. I may, I may fix that later. It doesn't matter though. I'm using uh, titanium white. Oh, by the way, and again, for you newcomers, it's always, you see this word right here? Alkyd, A-L-K-Y-D. It's, it's a uh, fast dry titanium white. It's very important to me. For the last five or six years, that's almost all I ever use. I rarely use <coughs> normal titanium anymore. Oh, you know what? I, I'm doing the wrong thing. I don't, I, I don't want to do light yet. I want to do dark. So hang on. I just mixed up a bunch of dark stuff and then realized, wait, wait, wait. That's not, that's not, I'm not in the right order there. So more, more liquid out on my palette. Just a little bit, just a little bit to make transparent marks with. And now a couple other brushes, mixing up some dark um, oxide red and dioxazine purple. Uh, and a tiny bit of phthalo. Too blue. That's often the case with phthalo, isn't it? A little bit goes a long way. I'm gonna add a little bit of permanent rose to that. There we go. All right, so I'm just, I'm just after a, a, f a dark mauve, dark, dark, dirty purple, rather than using just a, a neutral tone. And, and so this is step two. Let me, let me go back, step two of what? You've got some part of your painting, a fairly large area, not a, not a detail, but a fairly large area that you want lighter. The fastest way to achieve that is scumbling, opaque 
paint applied very thinly. With me? But scumbling is an un leaves an unpleasant texture. So if you have time, let it dry and then glaze over it like I just did. If you don't have time, go straight after scumbling. The next thing you do is, is um, come back and draw more details. Draw details in dark color and then follow up with details in light color. Uh, so again, how to, how to get values and color. There's a large area of your painting that is not the right value. It ended up so far, it's too light or no, 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 not too light. If it's too dark, I should say. If, if it's too light, you glaze it with transparent color. I'm assuming you already know that. Um, if not, glad I mentioned that. If you want it darker, you glaze it. If you want it lighter, you, you can scumble. Um, because it would take way too much time and too much paint to plast to make this all opaque. Oh, that would be horrible. So you scumble and then you come back with dark details and then, then finally finish up with light details, opaque light details. Uh, again, it, I, to say opaque light should be, in your mind, should be a redundancy. If I say opaque, you hear light. Or if I say light, you hear opaque. I don't need to say light opaque or dark transparent. That goes without saying. Should go without saying. <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of credit here. Okay? Everybody should know. Should. Not everybody does. But everybody should know that you get dark with transparent colors in oil painting. Oil and acrylic and you get light with opaque colors. All right, so that's how you, that's how you lift the value a large, of a large part of your painting. Scumble, dark details, light, opaque highlights. That's how you do it. And I'm in the dark details at the moment. Now, because I'm weird, <laughs> I also threw in one layer of, quick layer of chaos in the midst of that. That's what I did with that. Uh... I'm actually looking at the photograph over here quite a bit. Can you, can you see my picture? I think you can, right there. And uh, I'm also, I don't have it out here right now, but I have been uh, looking at the, um, the painting that, that I did three studies for this painting. A no tan, that is a black and white, three three layer, three three level, dark, medium, and light no tan, and then I did a, a color sketch. Um, gouache, and then I did a very finished oil painting. In this case, happened to be on aluminum. It doesn't have to. That's not necessary. I just thought it would be fun, and it was to paint on aluminum again. And uh, until today, I've had the aluminum painting out here looking at it. I, I, I'm pretty much beyond that at this point, I think. I don't need to follow that. It, it has already done its work in helping me uh, nail down the values in this painting. So now I'm looking at the photograph for details that I, would, I wouldn't include if if I didn't have a photograph to go by. Little su surprising things, if you will. Okay, changing my color slightly, a little more blue. Whoop, sounds like the natives are restless. Maybe sit down and work on these people's feet for just a minute.
Yep, I am. Now, right now, as you can tell, my task that I, that I have in front of me is to draw, basically. Draw with paint, draw with uh, fairly small brushes, and um, to draw. One way to describe my technique of painting, it's not, by no means the only way, right? You can, there's a thousand different ways to, to get the job done. But one of, my, one of my idiosyncrasies, I think, is that I isolate each problem or each step of the painting process. In other words, right now, my mindset, my mind is on drawing dark details. It's not on color very much, very little thought about color. Um, it's not on like overall composition. All these, all I'm doing right now is fine, small details of, of lines. So there's a lot I don't have to think about. All I have to think about is drawing. Now, one of the things that will re be the result of doing this layer of dark liney details one of the reasons one of the results of that is at the end of this phase right here this part of this painting will be a little bit too liney it'll have a little bit it'll be too dry <laughs> can you, you let me make up that word too much drawing too many lines too linear perhaps if you wanted to be a an english major about it too linear um, but that doesn't doesn't scare me a bit. It uh, doesn't bother me a bit. I'm perfectly happy at the end of this phase, this stage, to have a painting that is overly linear. Why? Because the painting's not done yet. I said this last week in my class. It ain't over till it's over. Painting's not done till it's done. And until it's done, it's not done. <laughs> and this is clearly not done. So it's okay with me if I end up with too many lines because I'm about to come back in just a minute with light, opaque highlights. And in that phase, many of these um, dark details will be obliterated, wiped out. Now what I'm doing right now is intermittent, intentional messiness. I'm getting in the habit, it's pretty pretty well established habit now, at the end of every stage of the painting process, oh, I can do some lines over here before I, is just, just do some mess, just make some art marks, just make some, you could call it expressive marks, but again, I don't want to confuse people. Uh, I am not trying to express myself with my artwork ever basically virtually i'm never trying to express myself i'm i'm trying to create a thing of beauty now i i do accidentally get expressed in the act of creating thing of beauty but that is not my objective at all all right so i am done now with the dark details some of the last stage down here and i don't know if this is the final stage on this uh, uh, this part of the painting it might be um but the final step in this three-step process, how do you make a part of your painting, a large part of your painting lighter? Okay, let's review real quick. How do you make, you have, you're doing a fine painting, all of a sudden you go, oh no, this part of the painting, a large area, it needs to be lighter, right? The answer is scumble. Opaque paint applied very thinly because you can do it really fast because you're, do, you're doing it with, for one thing, for among other things, with great big brushes, okay? So you can just put it, get it, get it down really quickly. Um, then you come back with dark details and then finish with light details. So I just finished the dark details. Now, if it's dry, if you have the luxury of a day in between, then, then add this step. Scumble, glaze, which you saw me do. Scumble, glaze, dark details, 
and light highlights. Now, if you're crazy like me, <laughs> and you also want to throw some beautiful chaos on your canvas, you ready? Okay, <laughs> then what I've just done is scumble, wait overnight, glaze, interesting marks, chaos, dark details, and now light details. I hope that was clear, but, the, the, you know, this is idiosyncratic to me. And, and using those sticks, of course, is not the only way to do that. Um, let me zoom in here as much as I can for just a second. And can you see, um, there's a big red line here. There's a big orange line right there. Uh, there's red and orange down there. There's brown here, here, here. Do you see those, Lake Poo? Here's a big red mark up here and up here. Oh, I'm sorry, part of that was, let me do that again. It's a big red mark up here and here, okay? And then some on this guy's red coat, red on his red coat, and then lines that go off the red coat. Okay, what are, what are those supposed to be? <laughs> interesting marks. And they are interesting. Now, how much of those will end up in the fi finished painting? Heck if I know, not my job to, to know. It's just my job to put them down. And then I will, right now, in the, what may be the final step of the painting process, um, I, I will cover up some of that, probably. I don't know how much. It's in the final edit is when I will decide how much. Oh, do you need help with your bike? Hang on, let me help you. Time out for rescue granddaughter. Yeah, they're all jammed in here, aren't they? All right, there you go. Have fun, be careful. This color I'm using is just a little bit too bright. Let me darken it a little bit. A little oxide red, a little yellow ochre. There we go. So what I'm doing now is typically called the final edit layer. There you go. Do you need help getting your bike out? Whew, you sure do. <laughs> All right, there you go. Have fun, be careful. I still need this to be just a little bit darker, so let me do that again. A little bit of oxide red, a little bit of yellow ochre. Um, I always, when I'm in the opaque realm, which is what I'm in right now, when I'm finally in the opaque realm of painting, um, I never put down a color anywhere. I put down a color and then follow it up, usually immediately, by applying a slightly lighter version of that color on top of the color that I just put down. Now, if that made sense, let me say that again. When you're painting in opaque, now for me, see, you see, the opaque realm in my, in Dan Nelson's world of painting is only the final edit layer. Everything up, until, up, up to this point has been mostly transparent, a little bit of a, opaque uh, white, acrylic in the early stages but uh, no opaque oil until now so now that I'm in the opaque realm then um, whenever you put down a color any color and of course it's opaque so it's light opaque you, you come back follow up that is to say those light strokes by coming back mixing up a color slightly lighter than that and putting it on top of the color you just put down. As I said, I, I usually do it right away. Is it? Not always, but it's usually something I, I don't wait and do it much later. I do it right then before I forget. 
and I am finding, <laughs> I'm surprised at this, I'm finding my, the color I'm using still a little bit too light. So I'm going to pick up some raw umber, my favorite, my go-to color for killing color is raw umber. Color killer color, I call it. It's my color killer color, raw umber and student grade, I actually prefer uh, more than, um, there we go, there we go. Now, and by the way, what, what? how do I know what I'm aiming for? The answer is I'm mostly matching what's already here, very close to matching what's already here. Now see this stroke right here, I'm going between two pencil lines. They were put on some time ago. Um, and in the act of doing that, I'm covering up to a large degree those earlier pencil lines. That's sort of what I'm, that's what I meant when I talked about earlier. Um, at the end of a pencil layer, I've got too many pencil marks on the canvas. But I don't worry about it because it's not my, it's, at that point, it's not my job to edit. It's just my job to do. And right now, I'm messing with that orange, that big orange stroke of oil stick that I, you saw me use just a few minutes ago. And I'm smudging it out, but not obliterating it. I'm, I'm diminishing it, but not eliminating it. There's a lot of that in the final edit. A lot of diminishing, very little wiping out or destroying or completely covering up. It's in the final edit. I diminish many details, features of the underpainting, but I eliminate almost none. I might have a word with the girls in a minute <laughs> and remind them that I'm broadcasting. They know the rules. They can play, but they're not allowed to fuss while Bigka, that's my name, Bigka, while Bigka is painting. Now, hang on just a second. Hey, girls, Tali, Tali, I'm broadcasting, so make just happy sounds, okay? Thank you, sweet girl. <laughs> By the way, it's not only when I'm broadcasting, just when I'm painting. I don't particularly care for sounds of stress and turmoil. You could probably imagine that. All right, I'm a, I, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing down here. Again, I, in this phase, by the way, I'm painting with dirty brushes right now. I'm a little bit proud of myself. <laughs> that, is, that is an area of growth for me. Um, getting to the paint, or point, <laughs> getting to the paint. <laughs> uh, uh, Freudian slip there. Getting to the point where I'm, I'm comfortable painting with Dirty brushes, that is to say, uh, brushes where the, the the paint that's on the brushes is not thoroughly mixed. So you don't ever know exactly what's going to come off. Which, given everything else, you may know, or not know, about my approach to painting. Um, then, given everything else, I ought to prefer dirty brush painting because it's one more way of infusing uh, happy accidents in your painting. It's, so anyway, it's, it's something I'm working on a little bit. All right, I'm not crazy about that orange streak going right through this, but there, I just left. Okay, I don't know if you can see this or not. Let me zoom in as far as I can. Um, there was a, a random orange stroke that I, that I did with an oil stick, right? Shiva uh, Painter's Paint Stick. New toy. It was, it's just there for visual interest. It's, it doesn't reflect anything in reality, like in the photograph, okay? But I didn't like it going right across this piece of curb. So I covered it up mostly there and there, but I still left a little dot right in the middle, still showing. Why? because it makes it a better painting. Why did, I, why did I cover most of it up? Because it makes it a better painting. Why did I leave some of it showing? Because it makes it a better painting. As I've said a lot lately, having grandchildren in the house has caused me to realize 
I have essentially the same answer to every painting question. Grandpa, my name's Bika. Bika, why'd you do that? Why did you do that? I've discovered the answer is always the same because I think it's going to look cool or because I think it looks cool or because I think it's going to look cool. A more, you know, adult language way of saying that would be simply be uh, because it's going, because it's, it makes it a better painting. Good to get these things nailed down. <laughs> Mixing up now more slightly lighter version of that brown. Um, this painting, by the way, is seven and a half feet tall, and uh, so I can't I can't raise it up any higher than this because uh, the top of it is hitting my garage ceiling. This is why I'm not can't paint indoors too because. My, my ceiling in my studio, I think is nine feet. That would leave what, nine inches at the top and nine inches at the bottom. <laughs> Not quite enough room for my easel. Let me back up. Well, you're seeing most of that now. Um, the effect, and let me, and I'm gonna stand back by the way and get a distant, more distant look at this. Yeah, yeah. So now, this whole section of the painting has, has a much more finished feel about it than it did a few minutes ago, but it's lighter, considerably lighter than it was before I put the, the glaze, the, no, I mean, the, not the glaze, considerably lighter than it was before I did the uh, scumbling, translucent stuff on it, uh, which was last week. So. It, it now lifts, uh, it, it's bright uh, the, way, the way I want it to be. Um, many, I would think most of my landscape paintings, or as you perhaps know, I, most of my landscapes are actually cityscapes. Most of my cityscapes um, have a dark threshold at the bottom of them. Of them. That's my most common uh, approach to painting is the foreground is dark and you step across the darkness. It's a threshold into the light of the painting. This painting is the opposite of that. As you can see, it's light in the foreground and we step through the light into the dark. So right up here, it's dark almost all the way across. Um, okay, right, way down here at the bottom, it goes, fades to dark a little bit, but that's not, that's hardly enough to, hardly enough to count. Um, the overall, the overall effect is light foreground. So that's why I, this had to be lighter than it was uh, last week. And at the moment, I'm quite happy with that. So um, Now, I've got just a tiny bit, in my opinion, in my eyeball opinion, you paint by eye, right? So I'm not painting by principle or rule or anything like that. I'm just painting by what, how it looks. A little bit too much um, paint stick down here. Uh, but I don't want to go down there with, with uh, paint. So I'm just going to pick up a rag. I dipped it in. Gamsol or whatever, yeah, I think it's Gamsol these days. Sands older, turpenoid, I think it's Gamsol. Anyway, and just paint with a rag. Same thing up here. Now I'm very rarely do I get, so to speak, mad at these random marks. It's like, oh, why'd I do that? That was stupid. No, 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 I don't paint that way. Very rarely do I, virtually never. Um, so I'm not erasing, if you will. I'm not mad at those marks, I'm just Diminishing them a little bit, but I'm very glad that they're there because they make all of this bottom part of the painting much more interesting than it would be if they weren't there. Why'd you do that, Bitka? Because it looks cool. Got it? All right, I think now that I'm back up here in the middle part of the painting, yeah, I'm going to switch to some short, shorter handle brushes, but some... Uh, 
larger, larger brushes. And I'm going to start tackling um, I, I, then in my eye caught these figures. They need some work too. Let me look at some of your comments. Color Nami says, do you stretch and gesso your own canvas? Also, why do some people paint the sides of the canvas? Some, some don't. Ah, Color Nami, very good questions. The answer is I absolutely stretched this because it's uh, seven and a half feet tall and 45 inches wide. Uh, so if you want a weird, weird, weird size like that, you have to stretch your own and gesso, of course several coats of gesso um, and I also paint edges why do some people don't pay the edges because they're ignorant <laughs> if you don't paint the edge the canvas needs a frame um, it's called this painting the edges the picture goes I don't mean the not just painting the edges the painting goes around the edges that makes sense that's called gallery wrap and if in fact if you gallery wrap then you don't need to buy a canvas. And I hate buying it. Then you don't need to buy uh, a frame. And frankly, I hate buying frames. <laughs> I hate wasting money on frames. So for the last, uh, for, uh, for 15 years, that's almost all I've done. And it took me a little bit in the first couple of years to learn the ropes and say, oh, what, you're supposed to do that all the time and so on. Uh, so I almost never paint on, oh, and it has to be also a wide canvas, not a narrow stretcher. There you go. So that's called gallery wrap. It's an inch and a half or more wide, and the picture is painted all around. You do see some people that just painted a flat color. Why do they do that? Because they're ignorant, because they don't know. Please don't do that. Um, it is, it is, that is, and the, the, uh, the artist didn't make up those rules. Uh, gallery uh, and the, the art world, the art market world made up those rules. Those are not, those are not, uh, negotiable by the artist you're just either doing it right or you're not and artists who don't paint the edges are just doing it wrong so there glad you asked very good question um and there was a couple other comments let me see taylor you'd love to see it natural light i know what are you what are you seeing right here yeah well unfortunately you see can you see my reflection on the painting <laughs> It's, there's, I'm in a garage, there's, the garage behind me is, is uh, open, so it is natural light, but it's all glare, that's the problem. What you're seeing here is glare. And these lights are color corrected, so they are um, very close to natural light. I have one light way up there that is not color corrected, it's a little bit warm, like incandescent bulb. But these two, the one right here by you that you can't see, and this one, are both uh, color balanced. So it's pretty close to correct color. It, it is a little bit of a challenge to paint uh, on a glossy canvas. And uh, what I'm struggling with is the glare of the open garage door behind me. All right, next comment. Michael McEwen, who was your inspiration to take up art? Does anyone in your family in the past or present paint? Very good question. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, um, my dad was a very good painter. Um, he w it was his hobby. He, he wasn't a professional by any means, uh, but he was very good. Um, in the, in the last 15 years, I've taught thousands of students, adults, mostly retirees, right? Just to give you some, uh, I mean, I grew up with my dad. <laughs> I grew up with my dad painting. I thought he was good. Um, uh, now that I've taught thousands of adults, um, oh, I've, uh, I've never had an adult student as good as my dad. Okay, now I don't, I don't typically teach professional painters. Does that, that make sense? Professional painters don't come to my art classes. Just want to make that clear. It's not because I'm. I'm not, I'm not, but I've, uh, just to give you some indicator, no, I've never had, never had an adult teacher. I've had some students as good as, some young people as good as my dad, but never had an adult. So he was good. He was a good painter, good drawer, very gifted as a young man, um, and, and very gifted as a middle-aged man. He tapered off painting, did, painted less as he 
entered his uh, 70s and 80s, I guess, um, which we were all disappointed about, but that's all right. So that's what that's what got me started. I, I by the time I, I usually say by the time I went to kindergarten, I thought I was an artist. But see, I thought everybody that went off to kindergarten was an artist. So I didn't I didn't think that was a big deal. And and I don't remember my parents in quote encouraging me in my art, but I look back and say they must have because it, it was never a big it was never a big deal. Like there was never what you're going to be an artist <laughs> like other people many people had that story you know that was never the case at our house it's like yeah okay cool major in art yeah you bet <laughs> yeah very so definitely definitely a leg up if you will to have a dad who's who's a good artist or a mom and and to have a you know a good healthy happy loving relationship with them all of my siblings are all of my siblings are quite artistic. Just none of them pursued it the way I did. Some of the later ones, I think, probably didn't pursue it because by the time they came along, I, you know, had developed quite a reputation as the class or as the family artist, and they kind of said, "Oh, to heck with that." <laughs> I, I don't think that was a wise decision, but that's what they did. All right, Mark Toomey. Hey, man, good to see you. Watching you from back in little New Zealand whilst on holiday. <laughs> Welcome home, man. How about that? It must be good to be home. So on holiday, wait, it's, oh yeah, okay, that's right. I'm sorry, I said it's January, of course. Of course, it's the middle of the summer for you guys. Or it's not January, it's February, okay, but middle of the summer down there. Gotcha. So you guys don't go on holiday in August, right? <laughs> it'd, be us, like, it'd be like Americans going on holiday at, you know, January. Well, cool. Thanks for checking in. Good to good to have you on board. Okay, I'm, I'm don't have to do much up here. And if you if you, you, you I'm sorry, you can't even see what I'm doing. I'm I'm sure I can barely see what I'm doing. I'm being very subtle and trying not to do fiddle too much. I think I'm quite happy with that down there. All right, let's tackle this this couple then. The figures here. Now let me look. Michael, same as me, Dan. You're no kidding. You're Michael. Your your dad was a local artist. Very cool. That is very fun to hear. And then there was another comment right after that. By the way, <laughs> here's a funny tip. <laughs> when you go to a restaurant or a coffee shop, at least in America. I think people habitually grab more napkins than they need at the coffee shop, especially. This might seem kind of funny, but I like it. I've gotten in the habit not only of taking my own napkins home, but my, my friends, my buddies who go at the coffee with me. <laughs> no, not their used ones. I don't mean that, but the ones that they didn't use. Or here at home, when, around the kitchen, around the supper table, um, especially with, you know, four kids in the house, little kids, grandchildren. Um, at the end of many meals, I'll walk around and grab the napkins that were either not used or just barely, barely, barely used. <laughs> so uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment is using leftover um, supper nap napkins and coffee shop napkins. <laughs> there, free tip, tip of the day. <laughs> All right, somebody else. Um, Oh my goodness, Michael, so your dad was an artist, your sister, and your son is a tattoo artist. That is very cool, man. Can I find your stuff online, Michael? I'm assuming, I, I don't think I've looked. I, I, I do, by the way, I do snoop on, s snoop on some of you guys, some of you regulars, of course, and occasionally say, look and see if I can find you on the internet somewhere, especially if I find your artwork. That's always kind of fun. I'm assuming you're doing the same toward me. Um, okay, let's zoom in here again so you can see what I'm doing. Sorry about that. Uh, I just have applied a little bit of light. And I already lengthened this woman's jacket once. And I do have a photograph of her. In the photograph, she's actually wearing like a real heavy sweater. Heavy, heavy woven sweater. 
This scene is uh, taken from a street corner in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, elevation 7,000 feet, so it's, it's a mountain town, University of Northern Arizona. Uh, our son and his wife both work there, and uh, we were visiting them, and our granddaughter, and my wife and I were visiting them in um, December. So everybody's walking around with, there wasn't, there was snow um, like in the gutters and in the, in the, sh in the shadows of the in the woods, where in, in the sh deep shadows. There wasn't any fresh snow when we were there. But it's definitely a wintertime climate. So this is a bundle up. And you can tell, I hope, by the way she is standing with evidently one hand in her pocket and this this hand holding a, a book or stack of books or a clipboard. It's, all, it's a college town for sure. There, I think I like that better. Um, I am not going to do any more detail than that. I'll, let me hang on a second. Let me pick you up so you can, in fact, no, let's tell you what, while I'm working on this, I'm going to move you. So forgive me for, hang on for the, the earthquake ride. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Navigating. All right, now. There's, I see, if I get out of the way, it's all glare. But if I'm standing here, um, it's just a little bit glare. All right, so I'll be, hang on, I'm coming back. So you can see what I'm doing. I have a, a medium, pale, yellow, brown. It, it is figures like this. You, you, you definitely want them, in my opinion, you definitely want them to be uh, soft edged and loose because if you do them too hard, first of all, you want them to look like they're, they're moving or they have moved. Even though this, this couple is, um, that glare is really bad, isn't it? Anyway, even though they're not moving fast, but you know they're not standing still, so the the fuzz around them aids in the illusion that they're moving. Okay, I'll be. I know the glare is terrible. I'll be back in just a minute. I'm coming over here to pick up some new brushes and some red paint for the man's coat. Uh, in the photograph. The, the man is wearing a, actually he's wearing a thick shirt, kind of a lumberjack shirt. And it's blue, maybe with a touch of purple in it. But uh, that's, this is one of the benefits or advantages of doing studies, preparatory studies. In my third study, I, on aluminum, I real, I, made the realization that like, oh, wait a minute, this would be a lot better painting if he was wearing red. So that's why he's got red. And I've, I've made it a coat, not a shirt, a little bit of a high collar there. You can see, I want him, I think he looks like, like he's kind of got his shoulders hunched a little bit, right? Does that look, look that way to you? In fact, in the photograph, he, he, he looks like he's got his shoulders slightly hunched. Um, and just a little shaft of purple uh, fuchsia raspberry color, cranberry color, right here on this color, I think. Nope, oh, too dark, hang on. I think it would be pleasant. There we go. Now do I want a comparable, maybe, maybe a touch right there. There we go. And this woman has bangs, doesn't she? I think that's okay. Let me sneak, I'm doing a little broken color here right now. This, this has, those two marks have nothing to do with realism. Those are just, little injections of 
broken color. Usually, I have a, usually in my painting in the last year, less than a year, um, I have a separate phase uh, for a painting process. Often the very, very last thing I do is go through and inject little bits of broken color. But right then I did it, even though I'm not necessarily right at the end of my painting. And, and my, okay, this arm needs, this woman's arm needs a little bit of work. Um, it doesn't have enough of a break in the elbow. And I, yeah, there's, oh, wait, you know what? Let me, let me do grab a, this would be a good time for a little scratchiness. So this, again, this is me being very unconventional. Um, you know, you don't use pencils on top of an oil painting. Are you, if you hear a little bit of, I'm being a little bit facetious, but that, that this is not standard practice to use a uh, pencil. It's, it's me being, it's my unusualness. By no means unique. In fact, one of the things that convinced me that it really was a good idea when I started a couple years ago was that uh, I saw several other artists um, that used pencils, usually abstract artists, but not always. I saw several other, uh, these, what are those lines, right? That's just uh, me intentional messiness. Um, so no, not, not traditional at all to use pencils, but I like, I like what just happened there. Okay. Oh, okay. My wife wants to know when I'm off because she wants to make a big noise. Probably power washing or something. It's nice here today. As you can see, it's sweatshirt weather. Uh, but it's been cold and rainy. It's going to be cold and rainy again tomorrow. We've had an, an extremely rainy the last couple of weeks. I think we had 11 days in a row where it rained, which is quite unusual for us. Okay, so did you see those those marks that I just made? Those random, if you will, random strokes. Um, I've been trying to describe to people this my new season I'm in, a new way of painting, and I talk about taking more time with my paintings. Of course, if they're larger, that translates naturally into more time. But uh, to most people would think that more time would mean. Uh, more detail and uh, I was describing this to someone and, and it dawned me oh I know how to describe it if that's the more time I spent on a painting get more and more and more and more real but my my way of painting is some of the marks are more real some of the marks are less realistic does that make sense you've you've seen me uh, do several of those marks here just in the last several minutes marks that, that are, are not realistic like that right there i don't think that had much effect but that was it all right i feel like i'm at a point now where i had better quit um with those with that that hang on let me try to get you situated where you can see this a little bit better that's why i've got you by the way high up in the air much of the time is so that you're getting less clear. So hang on a second. I'm going to blind you just for a second so I don't get all kinds of camera shake. Put you back where you were a little while ago. Hang on. Just about ready. All right. Let's try that. There we go. That's about as good as I can do. I mean, it's time for me to take a break just so I don't... Uh, get my nose too deep into it and, and lose sight of the big picture. I've at the moment now this will change, but at the moment now I'm, I'm quite, I've made good progress in just this last little while. So I feel like I've finished this, finished them possibly. And I'm probably done all the way up to about here. Um, work it's needed in here. Uh, very, very abstract. It's going to stay dark. So all, everything I do in here is going to be quite, subtle very subtle this sign needs work these do 
and and way up here the Aspen Avenue I've moved those letters a couple of times and they need to be fixed then I'm ready to go all the way up to let me pull it down and soon back up to the sky which I haven't worked on in quite a while there's what my bare tree branches look like and also this sign the letters over here are a little bit wonky they need to be fixed anyway I'm 95 or six seven percent done with the painting and I'm happy to say I'm happy with it I'm gonna cl close this broadcast right here let me look at the last few comments here Rick Charlotte says do I need to click the bell to get yes yes Rick thank you for noticing that if you want to get a notice from me that whenever I'm broadcasting then you have to click the bell if you just click subscribe I'll show up in your subscription feed but you won't get a notice so thank you for asking very good question and Michael again says, Michael, nothing on I just do it for fun. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, hard to be free. Michael, I, you probably found me because of my one um, um, a viral pen and ink video. Is that right? Some of you, I'm assuming many of you found me because of that one. Th three million views. Uh, of, of my pen and ink video. Uh, pen and ink was a huge part of my life as an illustrator and I still enjoy it, but now my life is mostly oil painting. And uh, IL Studio says, wow, amazing. Thank you guys. Always fun to have you on board. I can't wait to finish this painting and uh, I enjoy your company and your comments very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.